question and answer, John mentioned that for those of you who want to hang around, we might go over to one of the local restaurants and have coffee or something like that. So that if you've driven quite a ways, it isn't just going to be a short little thing here. I'm at your disposal for further information and contact. I also want to mention that my colleague Daniel Kernicki is here today. Daniel, would you stand, please? Right here, Mike. Right here. And uh, Daniel has written a book that's on the table there and uh, fills in some gaps about uh, the situation with economics in early America. I am not an economist. I'm a historian. And this talk today deals with the history of a theology. So for those of you who have questions about gold coins and the silver standard and the fractional reserve banking system, I'm going to ask Daniel to come up and handle those questions on my behalf. And he's certainly capable of doing that. Um, also, the question and answer period, I'm willing to open it to all subjects related to my other books. So you don't have to limit yourself to usury. We can also talk about Judaism and, and ancillary topics. Um, my book at 417 pages was about all we were able to do, and I wasn't able to include modern German and Islamic resistance to usury. So we have a few copies of these. They're free. There's four or five up there. And then when they run out, you can write to us, and there's a, there are a few dollars. This is my bi-monthly newsletter. But basically, to summarize um, here, we go into the uh, attempts to reform economics uh, under the Third Reich. But for those of you who are fans of the NSDAP and so forth, you'll find out that Hitler actually betrayed the leading money reform people in Germany and even had some of them killed, including Gregor Strasser in the Night of the Long Knives, and we can discuss that as well. Um, the Islamic uh, aspect and the Islamic take on it, I've sort of revised some of it because Islam has also created escape clauses and loopholes even though uh, the positive aspect of Islam is that there is a tremendous antipathy to interest on loans of money. So that, as a philosophical point, is important. And I'm glad, of course, that they do that. And it's part of the reason why we're making more on them, particularly on the Hawala banking system, which is almost absolute privacy. That's what was operating in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Um, they had the same privacy as the federal government has. We don't, we're not able to audit the Federal Reserve Bank, so they make their decisions in secret. Why can't we have our banking decisions in secret? Well, under Islam, uh, that's possible. So if you're interested in that, there's a few free copies up there. And um, finally, I'd like to preface my remarks with something that John and I discussed uh, previous to today, and that was the fact that I've seen in our movement, such as it is, a revolving door. I've seen people who are, I would call elite, educated people, people that we want to join us, and they'll come in to this movement. I've been involved in it since I was a kid in the late 1960s. And I see them come in for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. Typically, that's the run. And then they're out the door again, pretty disgusted. They come in with high hopes and a great deal of optimism, energy, all things that we need, because I think that the cryptocracy is sown in our ranks cynicism and defeatism in the sense that it's all over and it's too late, which fulfills Sun Tzu's uh, military precept that you win a battle without even firing a shot. So if we're already defeated, then they won the war and we never even enter the field of battle. And I think what happens to these elite people that come in and want to assist us, and we need this fresh blood, is they find that we don't have any victories. We just go from defeat to defeat to defeat. Our candidates for elected <coughs> office are defeated, and um, the, the uh, general tenor of the movement is one of defeat. So if you remember that speech at the start of uh, Patton that George C. Scott delivers, where he says that uh, Americans love a winner and despise a loser, and we've really been losers. That's what it really has been. And I think the reason for that is, is that we have dealt with symptoms. And we think that God is going to give us brownie points because we try to be good people and we try to sacrifice for the cause. But in point of fact, if we're not following God's law and God's rule book for victory, then we can't possibly have that victory and we're going to stumble from one defeat to another. Mm -hmm. And part of that stumbling block has been this issue of interest on loans of money, which is very, very difficult for us to accept, and I'm one of them, because when I began to research this subject, I didn't think that low interest on a loan was against the law of God or a bad thing. And 
my method of research is the Socratic method. Follow the evidence wherever it leads without a confirmation bias. Most of our people, even in our own ranks, and of course the liberals and leftists have it as well, they have confirmation bias, meaning that we only look for the information that will confirm our own preconceived ideas. You can't write history that way, and you can't even really live your life that way. So I started out with the idea that I was going to investigate excessive interest on loans, which is the modern definition of usury, and I discovered that all interest on loans is not only against the law of God, but was against the heritage of Rome, Greece, and uh, the early Christian church all the way up until May 5th, 1515, which I'll talk about in here. Um, basically, the Bible classifies as thieves those who seek to gain from others. <coughs> it's that fundamental. <coughs> you know, the idea that we're going to drive a hard bargain at the flea market or whatever, well, your loss is my gain, that, that was considered theft. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to promote our neighbor's advantage. They are supposed to be advantaged by our dealing. We sell them a boat, we sell it at a really good price, it's a great boat, or if it's a defective boat, we let them know, hey, it, the engine needs repairing and, and, and other aspects, but I'm giving it to you at a good price. And that's how Christianity and the kingdom of Christ is spread, by the, that type of behavior and those types of attitudes. Okay. This talk does not deal with symptoms of the money power, whether they be the Federal Reserve Bank or the gold standard or some other economic nostrum. The money power is supreme over the power of creators, inventors, farmers, manufacturers, engineers, architects, and poets because of the permission for interest on loans of money. Dante, in his Divine Comedy, in the section titled The Inferno, linked sodomy with usury. And I heard some people talking in the audience today about the sodomite marriage. I, by the way, don't use the Orwellian newspeak word gay, which actually has occult connotations in terms of it used to be synonymous with alchemy. Um, I just call it for what it is. And I think that whenever they trap us to using the word holocaust or the word gay, these Orwellian newspeak words that have been imposed on us, once again, we've already lost the battle before we even commence our argument. So this is from Canto 11 in Dante's The Inferno, which is the first part of the Divine Comedy. And he says, both Sodom and Cahors, Cahors is spelled C-A-H-O-R-S, both Sodom and Cahors and all those souls who hate God in their hearts and curse his name. Okay, so we know what he means by Sodom. He's talking about sodomy. What does he mean by Cahors? Cahors was a city in the south of France, widely known in the Middle Ages as a thriving seat of usury. Dante uses the city names to indicate that sodomites and usurers are on the same level. So sodomy is a disreputable mortal sin, and usury is a respectable mortal sin. But they're both still mortal sins. God doesn't change, and we should not be seduced by situation ethics, which is really the main value, situation ethics. The only way you can justify taking interest on money, in my opinion, is through situation ethics. A law was passed in Indiana recently granting the right of Christians and others to refuse to be coerced into helping to celebrate sodomite unions by delivering flowers or baking cakes for the occasion. This refusal is presented to us in the media as bigotry. How many years will elapse in the chronicle of our decline and fall before the refusal to service an incestuous marriage between a lecherous uncle and his naive niece or a deluded brother and sister is also labeled bigotry? Almost everyone, even leftists in 2015, can still see the perversity in incest, whether or not the excuse that the incestuous couple love each other is invoked. In 2015, it is still not an act of bigotry for a florist or a baker to refuse to honor an incestuous relationship. And the only reason that a refusal to honor a sodomite relationship is deemed bigotry now is that we have been sufficiently processed to regard anal sexuality between two men as an acceptable practice if they love each other. With that revolutionary standard as our guide, the day is not too far off when we will be programmed to accept the woman in her dotage who seeks to marry her great dame because she loves the dog and wants to take him to bed with her. 
Returning to the Indiana law, despite the lofty pronouncements of the political prostitutes who first sponsored it, as soon as the money power objected, the so-called business interests, including Walmart, then the political prostitutes who pose as conservatives, but whose god is the love of money, diluted the law out of all recognition and rendered it largely toothless for fear of the money power. Sodomy gains acceptance thanks to the love of money, and we see here Dante's confluence of usury and sodomy. Usury is based in sterility, and sodomy is based in sterility. Money, breeding money, is an unnatural thing, and was considered as such not just by the God of Israel and the Mosaic Code by the ancient Romans and Greeks. This speech is a brief summary of the main points in my book, Usury in Christendom, The Mortal Sin That Was and Now Is Not. And I preface my remarks with the observation that I am not opposed to free enterprise. Usury free enterprise built the Middle Ages, during which money was not a king, much less a god. Usury free enterprise constructed the Gothic cathedrals. I don't know if very many of you have been to Europe or Great Britain and stood in the presence of those magnificent edifices, which we still can't figure out how they constructed it today. That was done without usury. It was a society where agrarian values, such as Thomas Jefferson celebrated, were at the center of society. It was a society that combined the spirit of invention with the God and his law. Usury is the charging of interest on loans of money upon which our entire banking and financial system is predicated. So what we really have is, is we have the love of money weaponized as usury. And when I say usury, I am not employing, employing the modern falsification of the definition of usury as excessive interest on loans because that was not the definition for 1,500 years. Usury always was and is any interest on loans, 1% or one penny. Usury is a heinous crime and represents yet another example of the overthrow of God's eternal law. But can it be described as just one from among many such revolutionary departures from the divine law? Is it the most serious of all sins? I would argue that it is the worst of all violations of God's law based on 1 Timothy 6, 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. A very, very difficult passage for we moderns to digest and accept. Usury is the engine that, draw, that drives the love of money. That's why our people don't want to give up usury. They love making money from the interest they get from loans. They love it so much it has become their God. Mammon has replaced Yahweh as God in our lives. Well, either we will follow the love of God through obedience to his law, or we will embrace the love of usury because money has become our master, as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. It is important for us to know who it was in Christendom that first nullified God's law and usury, because there's a lot of confusion about that, and Protestants mainly get the blame. Not because we want to blame or scapegoat anyone, Catholics, Protestants, or even Judaics, but because as detectives and historical sleuths, we need to know who first perpetrated it in order to track it and now obstruct it and arrest it in the present. But before we undertake that investigation of trailing and tracking, let's be sure that we're clear about usury being against God's law, because today both modern Catholic and modern Protestants are involved in charging interest on loans and see nothing wrong with it. What does the word of God say? Psalm 15, 1 and 5. Yahweh, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that does not ask interest on loans and cannot be bribed to victimize the innocent. Ezekiel 18, the upright man is law-abiding and honest. He never charges interest on in usury on loans, takes no interest, abstains from evil. It is Yahweh who speaks, end quote. 
Edward the Confessor, the medieval Catholic king of England. Please study his life. He was the last Saxon king of England. And he wrote, Usura radix omnia malorum. Usury is the root of all evil. As monarch, King Edward, who was the last Saxon king, banished all who charged interest on loans from his kingdom. Usurers who remained in Saxon England were subject to the confiscation of their property and declared to be outside the protection of the law. In other words, they were outlaws. A few months before his death, Edward's usury-free England was described as a rich and prosperous kingdom. Pope Innocent IV, who lived two centuries after King Edward, declared, quote, usury, usury is generally prohibited because if it were allowed, all manners of evil would ensue. It is clear that practically every evil follows from usury, end quote. Do we have all manners of evil ensuing today? I believe we do. And above all, we have the words of Jesus Christ in Luke 6, 32 through 36. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? <coughs> For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be called sons of the Most High, for he, meaning Yahweh, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil, Be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Okay, now let's deal with some of the objections which maybe even some of you harbor. Some people allege that the Old Testament's prohibition of usury against the poor in Exodus serves as a justification for interest to be taken from brethren who are not poor. The Protestant Roger Fenton in his 1612 book, Treatise of Usury, answers this error, quote, immediately before this law of usury in Exodus 22:22, there is a law for widows and children. Thou shalt not trouble any widow or fatherless child. Now Fenton asks, does it therefore follow that we may trouble a married woman or a child that has a father? So the prohi prohibition in one part of the Old Testament against usury against the poor is not to say that you can charge it against the well-off. The other thing that's often brought up is that because usury is a weapon of warfare, because it destroys those who are targeted with it, that ancient Israel allowed usury against the Gentiles. And of course, people who don't understand that Judaism is not an Old Testament religion will then say, see, this is how the Jews behave. Well, Judaism is a Talmudic religion that nullifies the Old Testament, has nothing to do with the Old Testament. So we're talking about Old Testament Israel now. And the God of Israel never passed any enactment against all Gentiles or foreigners or strangers as that language is used. And this is where a great deal of confusion comes about the critical distinction between Ger and Nokri. Some people say that this permission is in uh, Leviticus. They say God forbids the oppression of strangers, which is prohibited in Leviticus 19, while the interest taking of strangers is permitted in Deuteronomy 23. So is this a contradiction? No, it's a case of mixing apples and oranges based on a faulty translation because it's based on the English text of the King James Version, where strangers are not distinguished and made linguistically distinct. The strangers who are not to be oppressed in Leviticus are quite different from the foreigners of whom we may take usury in Deuteronomy. In Leviticus, the Hebrew term used is ger. In a parallel text, in Exodus 23.9, we read, you shall not oppress a ger. It's G-E-R. For you were also ger in the land of Egypt. The ger were what we usually think of today as an immigrant, someone from another country. The key distinction is that the ger were not hostile to the Israelites in the land in which they dwell. As a condition of them residing in another land, they agreed to abide by the laws of the land. Thus, ancient Israel accommodated non-Israelites as long as they lived according to the laws of God. On the other hand, the foreigners spoken of in Deuteronomy were, as designated in Hebrew, Nokri, N-O-K-R-I. 
In all usage of this term in the Old Testament, the Nakri were wicked, hostile aliens with whom God's people must not intermarry and with, whom, with, with whose gods they must not embrace. Israel was dedicated to unrelenting warfare against the Nakri. Why? Because the Nakri were inevitably involved in magica sexualis in terms of the worship of their deities. And this the God of Israel hated as much as good Christians today hate it. Magica sexualis. And so that was it. That was it for them. So usury is a weapon of warfare employed against one section of the strangers or foreigners, not all. Here's another scam that, that reappears again, forbidden only against the poor. In his excellent book, Usury, Destroyer of Nations, S.C. Mooney confronts the usury advocacy of modern Protestants and Catholics about Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20. Quote, you shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, or anything that is lent. You may charge a foreigner, a nokri, interest, but you may not charge your brother interest that your Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake in the land that you are entering to take possession of. For 15 centuries, this Bible passage was understood by the church to be exactly as it reads, zero interest on loans, whether to the wealthy or the indigent. But from the Renaissance onward, however, modernist heretics created two loopholes in Deuteronomy 23, that it only condemns high interest rates and that it only applies to the poor. But keep in mind that usury, which is generally unlawful, is especially unlawful and dangerous in the case of the poor. So what it's reminding us of, it's bad for all of us to be subject to usury, but who would suffer the most? The poor. It isn't limiting it to the poor, it's setting an alarm about the poor. They're the most vulnerable to this type of oppression. The mention of a certain type or class of person does not imply that the law does not hold in the case of those who are not mentioned. Let's disprove this rich-poor distinction. The very ones who claim that the mention of the poor in Exodus 22-25 and Leviticus 25-35 makes the usury statute only applicable to the poor and, and also state that all debts of all people are canceled after seven years, which is the sabbatical year. They say, no man is allowed to tax his own future by means of debt. <clears throat> the length of the debt is limited to seven years. And this is Gary North, for some of you who are familiar with that Calvinist theologian, and I hope he has repented of his false prophecy that he made during uh, Y2K and bankrupted thousands of people with the notion that it was the end of civilization as we know. It's been many years since then. I don't know whether he repented of it or not. But anyway, that's his argument but he also favors interest on loans of money. With Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 11, they don't make a distinction between rich and poor Israelites. They say Deuteronomy applies to every Israelite with regard to the sabbatical year. Well, why do they not hold that only the debts of the poor brethren are to be canceled in the sabbatical year and not those of the rich? They're not even being consistent with their own argument. The Puritan theologian Robert Bolton forcefully restated the biblical and patristic doctrine which most modern thinkers who call themselves Christians have distorted or nullified. Quote, not so much as the least usury was lawful to a brother, whether he were rich or poor. If the scriptures had put such a difference between the poor and the rich as between the Israelite and the Canaanite, to the rich thou may, but to the poor thou mayest not, lend upon interest on usury, then the case would be clear. But in Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20, God makes opposition not between the rich and the poor, but between Israel and the Canaanites. All right, let's move on to the New Testament. One of the first things that people think of when I discuss this topic is the parable of the talents. And they think that Jesus advocated usury. Well, I just read to you from Luke 34, 6, 34 through 36. So if he advocates usury, he's completely contradicting himself in Luke. For 15 centuries, the church did not teach such a grotesque and superficial interpretation of the parable of the talents. But they plumbed the parable <clears throat> for the lesson our Lord was seeking to impart, which is this. It is the hard man who expected his money to be put out at usury. Luke 19, 12 through 24. 
And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. And it came to pass that when he returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And another man came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a cloth. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up which thou layest not down, and reapest what thou did not sow. Remember that part. And the master said unto him, Out of thine own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. Thou know that I was an austere man, taking up that which I laid not down, and reaping that which I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury. And the master said unto them that stood by, Take from the servant the pound, and give to him that hath ten pounds. End quote. The substantive point is that Jesus' statements are made in reply to the mentality of the servant. He was a negative thinker. He was thinking bad thoughts. He called his master in the Greek an austere man. Austere is a harsh man. The servant is regarding his master, Jesus, as a ruthless man. The advice to put money at interest is based on an if-then proposition. The wicked servant had slandered his master in an attempt to justify his own laziness. If Christ is a cruel master, then the servant is justified in putting the money at interest. The parable of the ten talents is not advocating usury. It is giving a lesson in the evil effects of being imprisoned by one's own evil thoughts. The key to understanding the parable will be found in Jesus' statement, by your own words, I will judge you. In other words, if as a servant, this servant considered his own master a thief, then as the servant of a thief, the very least he could have done was steal for his master in a way that would have put, not put him at any risk by putting his money in a bank that paid usury. So the servant told two lies. First he said his master was a harsh man. This is a lie, for the Lord is merciful and gracious. Next he called his master a thief because he reaped what he did not sow. And finally the master said to him, Why didn't you insult, why didn't you add insult to injury and loan the money out at interest? So you could insult your master as a user or two. The Geneva Bible notes of the 1599 Geneva Bible state that Jesus did not alter the law on usury but validated it. He identified usury for what it is, theft, plain and simple. The parable of the talents also puts an end to the hypothesis that usurious business loans are acceptable. The word bank in Luke 19.23 is translated in the Greek trapeza, from which our English word trapeze is derived a circus apparatus that at best is very risky. And it's the same Greek word in Matthew 21, 22 that's used when Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers. The tables that he overthrew are called a trapeze. Now there's one more that people confront me with, and that's the parable of the, un, of the uh, unjust steward and the mammon of unrighteousness. And it's very difficult parable even if the topic isn't usury. And he also said, and well, actually, you know, I'm going to preface this with, uh, with, if we have enough time, I think I will go into it. Um, I, Rand Paul has been attacked lately, um, and I know a lot of you believe that he's a sellout and nothing like his father. Of course, they're both usurers, so, you know, keep that in mind. But um, the cryptocracy, it seems to me, is opposed to Rand Paul and fears him. And um, what you see here is, you see an example of Rand Paul not really being prepared for the attacks that the media would launch at him. And so he was on the Today Show. I don't really you know, watch the Today Show. I don't know who Savannah, whatever her name was, that was used to attack him. But I was listening to the radio driving down from Grand Rapids on NPR, and they had a section of that repeated. And uh, she was, what she was saying wasn't wrong. She was asking him, why did you first say that uh, the state of the Israeli state is illegitimate and now you're saying it's legitimate? 
but she said it in a tone or tenor of malice and hostility. And it was very insulting and disrespectful. And that tone is never used on Hillary Clinton or even the Republican neocons and Zionists. But it was used on him. And um, he apparently, even with a few million dollars in his coffer, he hasn't hired a PR guy to give him some training to be able to say to this interviewer, um, I wish that you could be a little more polite in how you're framing your question, but I'd like to let you know that it's not a matter of inconsistency. I hold to my principles, but there's been a change in circumstances. Instead, he fell right into the trap, said that she was editorializing, raised his voice, and now, because the media is in fear that he appeals to young libertarians, conservatives, and women, and they're often saying that Republicans don't play well with women, They've now created the idea, because if you notice, most of the hostile interviewers that they assigned this case were women. They're now saying Rand Paul has a problem with women. So this shows to me whatever his faults, and they are numerous, obviously, because I'm talking about usury. His father is an advocate of Ludwig von Mises and the Austrian School of Economics, which are anathema to me. But I bring this up because we're going into the parable of the mammon of unrighteousness. And I think you'll begin to see some parallels on how inept our people are in dealing with these interviews and everything else. I mean, can he be so naive as he really didn't think he was going to have a hostile interviewer and be prepared for it and understand that he had to be restrained? And, and so this, to me, is what Christ is talking about here. He said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou may no longer be steward if you don't give a good account. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord is going to take away my stewardship. I can't dig. To beg I am ashamed. I'm resolved what to do then. When I am put out of the stewardship, that he may receive that they may receive me into their houses. So he's going to lose his job, but he wants to still be popular. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much do you owe my master? And the, desert, the debtor said, A hundred measures of oil. And the steward said unto him, Take the bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then the steward said to another debtor, How much do you owe? And the debtor said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said, Take the bill and write fourscore. And the master commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And so Christ says, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. When Christ tells his followers to make friends of the unrighteous mammon, he's not asking us to make friends literally, but figuratively. We are to be like the worldly people in the sense that they should adopt the same acquisitive attitude toward figural and spiritual riches as the covetous man does earthly riches. In this parable, Jesus did not command the men's dishonesty. He calls him unjust. He only used him as an illustration to show that even the wicked sons of the world are shrewd enough to provide for themselves against coming troubles. Christians ought to be more shrewd because they are concerned with spiritual and eternal matters. Rand Paul should have been more shrewd. The authentic biblical teaching about debt and finance, crime, punishment, imprisonment, how we are to govern, is strangely unknown or criminally falsified in this information age of ours, where the information is largely controlled, as our elections are, by the money powers ministers of Satan. The lovers of money are not the prime targets of the religious right. The mortal sin of greed is barely an issue for these right-wingers. Yet pray tell, what corrupts a nation and a people more than the love of money? Jesus had perfected that law, law on loans in Luke 6, lend expecting nothing in return. And the Catholic Church upheld this for 15 centuries until the Renaissance when Catholics not Protestants, first change God's law. The Protestants get the blame, however, specifically John Calvin. Max Weber, in his 1904 book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, taught us to associate capitalism with Calvin. But most English authors before the 18th century 
followed Luther in emphasizing the papist nature and history of usury often included, and the Puritans often included a tolerance for usury as being, quote, among the rags of Rome that they believed and filed the Anglican Church. In 1629, Matthew Sutcliffe claimed in his book, A True Relation of England's Happiness, quote, simony and usury are among the Romanists so common that as Matthew Paris says, they account the first no sin and the second a small sin. The Pope has ordinary banks of usury, as the world knows, and Popish writers confess, where they speak of their Monte di Pieta, which is Latin for mountains of piety, but it means mountain of charity, mountain of compassion. But well, we're coming up on May 4th, 1515, and I may try to do something with this on May 4th. May 4th, 1515 is the 500th anniversary of the <coughs> Medici Pope Leo X, Giovanni di Lorenzo de' Medici, who despised Luther, issuing a papal bull permitting interest on loans of money if the loans were to the poor. These so-called charity banks were known as the Monte di Pieta, but quite a bit of revenue ended up in the hands of the Medici, not the poor. And even if these usury banks had been operated for the alleged benefit of the poor alone, they were violating God's law and more importantly, creating a precedent for more usury. Pope Leo X initiated a process of gradualism whereby the church's immemorial dogmatic law against the charging of interest on loans of money was incrementally relaxed and diluted. Did he abolish the law with one stroke of a pen? No, that's not how they work. But it led to a papal revolution, culminating in the complete abolition of all ecclesiastical penalties for usury by Pope Pius VIII in 1830 in his bull, Datum in Audencia, as well as the absence of all penalties for usury in the 1917 and 1983 codes of canon law. <coughs> we need to purge ourselves of two pernicious historical myths. The first is the rumor disseminated by the usurious banking houses themselves and later perpetually recycled by the right wing that the so-called Jews were the major financial force implicated in this usury. Now this may shock you. In my book, Usury in Christendom, there is not one Judaic banking house that is even worthy of mention in this early period. Not one. Every bank I implicate will be primarily Catholic and Gentile. Yet who gets the blame for usury in this epic? The Jews. But what's going on? This is deliberate misdirection. Remember, the cryptocracy operates just as well in the Gentile right wing as it does in the liberal left wing. Notice, too, that I say in this early epic, much later, Judaic banking houses like the Rothschilds will become supreme. But this is 350 years before the rise of the Rothschild banks. If the Judaics are involved, they're involved philosophically and theologically in terms of the Cal Talmudic and Kabbalistic infiltration of the Vatican under people like Johannes Reuchlin, Pico della Mirandola, and uh, Father Ficino and others. But that was philosophical and not material. The massive initial profits from the Renaissance pap papacies, gradual relaxation of the laws against usury, are first gained by the Gentile banks. Historian Richard A. Goldwaith informs us that the Roman company of Vieri di Cambio dei Medici was the original foundation of the great Medici bank of the 15th century and papal Rome remained at the center of this banking dynasty's business empire. The papacy obtained loans from the Medici Bank in the late 15th century by borrowing directly at stated rates of interest. That's usury. You will find this fact on page 250 of the paperback edition of the book The Economy of Renaissance Florence, published by Johns Hopkins Press in 2011. 
So here we have the papacy violating divine law and the law of the church itself by doing business with a usury bank even before the pontificate of the Medici Pope Leo X. This usury banking corrupted the hierarchy of the Church of Rome and it began the policy of letting the money power choose the personnel of the church. This is when it started, not during the Enlightenment or under Kant or Rousseau or the French Revolution. Vatican II has its roots 500 years back. The papacy would sometimes pay back what it owed to the Medici banks by selling ecclesiastical offices. In the early 1500s, more than 258 positions in the church were sold to banker Filippo Strozzi. A traffic in this kind of investment was thus initiated. Medici Pope Leo X allowed interest on loans to the supposed Monte Charity banks for the poor on the basis of situation ethics. According to this pope, it was now time to adjust God's law to suit the contingencies of the poor or so it was said. What was the reality? Let's go back to 1486. 29 years before Pope Leo X permitted interest on loans to the Monte operations. In that year, 1486, the papacy's apostolic chamber took the first step toward regularizing the papacy's debts through an agreement with a consortium of Italian banks. 46 of these banking houses, mostly based in Florence and Genoa, were able to fi fully fund the papal debt with the establishment of Monte della Fede, so-called charity bank, and over the course of the next hundred years, with the full knowledge of the popes of Renaissance Rome, 40 other usury operations were established by these banking houses under the guise of Monte charity banks. Let's disabuse ourselves of mystification and gullible Boy Scout images of the Renaissance papacy, which is based entirely on empty and hypocritical rhetoric on the, pope, on the basis of the popes of the Renaissance onward. The numerous Monte banks paid interest in the form of annuities, which were inheritable, thereby creating dynastic wealth for families who were inside the usury network. More importantly, Though the Monte Bank, through the Monte Banks, the papacy institutionalized its borrowing, creating a permanently funded debt that opened opportunities for investors who were seeking to obtain a usurious profit. What does this signify? It signifies that in the time of the limited permission for usury granted by Pope Leo X in 1515, the money power which had previously lurked on the margins of the church, right? Because it's always there. This evil is always present. It wasn't like it didn't exist in the Middle Ages, but it had been shoved off by great saints like St. Anthony of Padua, St. Francis of Assisi, Thomas Aquinas. All these formed a bulwark against that evil. But it was now gaining control of the church commensurate with the rise inside the Vatican of Neoplatonic ideology the Kabbalah, Egyptian paganism as personified by the enigmatic figure of Hermes Trismegistus. I realize that's quite a mouthful to say, but this is the subject of my next book, which I've been working on for the last two and a half years, called The Occult Renaissance Church of Rome. And I keep moving the, schedule, the completion schedule it had, I was saying September of this year, Maybe, God willing, now maybe it looks like January 2016, but it's a, it's a vast subject, and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, let's move 30 years ahead from Leo X's permission for the Monte Banks and briefly examine the representative career of one of the new type of Renaissance churchmen, which the money power had put into place. And this was Benvenuto di Paolo Oliveri, born 1496, he died 1549. He was from Florence. He held the post of depository of the apostolic chamber at the same time that his bank was making loans to the papacy in every possible way. In 1542, he was named the Pope's apostolic secretary in return for a loan to the Pope. This usurer became the Pope's banker. The Pope in question was Paul III. This is the Pope that the Church of Rome apologist Eamon Duffy in his paperback edition of the celebrated history of the popes on pages 212 and 213 said, and I quote, 
that Paul III was abolishing most of the scandalous sources of revenue. What? He, he made this user his banker, and he was also a depository of the apostolic chamber. I'm not sure what that phrase means. It means he deposited the gold in the apostolic chamber. I don't know. So this is baloney. Paul III was deeply in debt. He was financing the wars of Charles V, the father of Philip II of Spain. The same Charles V whose armies had sacked the Vatican in 1527. <laughs> And Paul III was rebuilding St. Peter's itself with the help of Michelangelo. Meanwhile, Paul III's apostolic secretary, Oliveri, was buying up the treasuries of the city-states of Perugia, Parma, and Piacenza, and charging interest on loans in several of the Monte Charity banks. In 1543, Oliveri's banks had profits at three times the level which the Medici Bank in Rome had had in 1427 when usury was still officially banned. By Oliveri's time, the increase in the number of loans made through the <coughs> proliferation of Monte Banks resulted in ever more power and profit. But no Italian bank could equal the power and profits of the German House of Fugger. And the Fuggers were, as the Protestants would say, Papists, deeply involved in opposing Martin Luther. Leo X's devious gradualism was one of the changes that the Church of Rome instituted, and this is hidden history, which motivated Luther to break with the Church. It wasn't just indulgences, although that was part of it. It was one of the grievances cited by English Protestants against Rome, because the Catholic nominalist philo uh, philosophers who were based in Germany, in Tubingen, and the Catholic Fugger banking dynasty in Germany continually pressured the church to make changes in favor of usury. As for example, fixing a morally acceptable rate of interest. And Luther's most eminent theological enemy was the Catholic theologian Johannes Eck. And so-called traditional Catholics champion Eck against Luther and Calvin, while condemning Calvin for permitting a 5% interest rate on loans. But 5% is the rate that the Catholic Fugger banking dynasty wanted to push forward through their papal agent, Johannes Eck. The thesis of my book, Usury in Christendom, is that the Renaissance Roman Church parted ways with the church of all time. It had trafficked in fake relics and indulgences as supervised by the Fugger bankers of Augsburg. The Fugger banker agent would accompany the man who was selling the indulgences and he would hold the chest where the money was deposited. The Fuggers, with the support of the Habsburgs, were far wealthier than any single Italian banking dynasty, including the Medici. Did you ever hear of the Fuggers? Did you know they were a motive for Luther's rebellion? The Fuggers controlled the transfer of revenues from the German church to the papacy and their loans to the Pope brought them a portfolio of revenue collecting privileges, including the sale of indulgences. In 1519, the Fuggers bought the election of Spain's Charles V to the, the, uh, to the rank of Holy Roman Emperor. Of the 851,000 Rhenish florins raised to purchase the office for King Charles, the Fuggers contributed 543,000 florins, and that was a staggering price in that day. They were usury bankers to the House of Habsburg and the papacy. In September 1514, eight months before Leo X's relaxation of the usury ban, papist theologian Johannes Eck of Ingolstadt Luther's nemesis was the corrupt mascot for the money power as personified by the banker Jacob Fugger. And no, despite the name Jacob, he was not of Judaic heritage. Eck argued in a debate at the Carmelite Monastery in Augsburg that loan contracts at 5% interest were justified. <coughs> and this came out of the philosophical and theological school in Germany led by Conrad Summonart and others like him, and it's in my book. Is it a coincidence 
that Medici Pope Leo X issued his papal bull Mantis Piatus the very next year. And he knew it would be so unpopular that he had to threaten to excommunicate every Catholic, it's right in the bull, who opposed the Pope's gradualist overthrow of the magisterial dogma by his legalization of usury in the name of charity. Apologists have told me, Catholic apologists, that Leo X did not change the dogma on usury, but just the pastoral application of the dogma. See, and that sounds to me like this is a uh, Judaic magazine tikkun. And later on, I'm going to quote from it. But they've got some of those loopholes and, and that, those cavils and those quibbles, and, and I don't buy it. Pastoral means, they say, were employed, and it didn't hurt the dogma, but pastoral means gradually transformed usury from a mortal sin to what it is today. It's no sin at all. So what do you want to argue uh, semantics about whether it was a revolutionary formal overthrow of doctrine, which they seldom do, or whether it was a pastoral form of gradualism and incrementalism, the end result was the same. Usury, the mortal sin, is no mortal sin at all. Well, this pastoral technique for nullification of the law of God should be familiar to all students of the devious tactics of revolutionary change agents, among whom the most notable contemporary example is the current pontiff, Pope Francis, the spiritual heir of Giovanni di Lorenzo de' Medici. Between 1519 and 1520, Martin Luther breathed fire on usurers and two sermons of power and conviction as an accompaniment to his tract open letter to the Christian nobility of the German nation 1519 followed by preface to an ordinance of the common chest 1523 in these he pits the German nation against the money power of the Renaissance church as it was promoting usury covert and overt in church and state and it's ironic that Luther's argument was consonant with medieval Catholicism. He was the one who was being faithful to the medieval Catholic Church while Rome was betraying it. I'm going to quote from Luther now. The greatest misfortune of the German nation is certainly the traffic in annuities. The devil invented this system, and the Pope, by confirming it, has injured the whole world. Therefore, I ask and pray that everyone open his eyes to see the ruin of himself, his children, and his heirs, which not only stands before the door, but already haunts the house, and that emperor, princes, lords, and cities arrange that this trade be condemned as speedily as possible, without considering the opposition of the Pope and all his justice and injustice, nor whether benefices or endowments <coughs> depend upon it. In other words, he's saying, if you have to go broke to serve the Lord, do so. Amen. I'm not a Lutheran, but I am a disciple of Socrates, or at least the Socratic method. And that is, you follow the evidence wherever it leads. That, to me, is what is revisionist history, the revising of the official record. Some people mistake revisionist history for the attempt to denude or debase our history. But new facts and information are always coming to light as long as men and women have curiosity and do the digging. So why then should not the historical record be revised? I know an attack on the money power when I see one, and that's what Luther was launching. Am I supposed to cover it up because it comes from Luther? Would that be honest? Would that help us track and expose how the love of money came to predominate in our civilization? Luther's, Luther's view in this regard is reflected in the classic Catholic teaching and in Christ's commentary. And Luther said, commenting on uh, Luke 6, 34 through 36, it does not teach when Jesus says, lend without charge, for there is no need for such teaching, since there is no lending except lending without charge. And if a charge is made, it's not a loan. Christ wills that we lend not only to friends, the rich, and to those who, to whom we are well disposed, who can repay us again by returning this loan, but also that we lend to those who cannot 
or will not repay us, such as the poor and enemies. End quote from Martin Luther. Inspired by Luther, Jacob Strauss, a Protestant preacher at Berchtesgaden and later pastor of Eisenach, advocated the implementation of Mosaic law according to the light of Christ in the struggle to abolish interest on debt in the name of Christian love. Strauss's 51 theses against usury banned the taking of even a penny of interest. <coughs> Strauss believed that the church made a mockery of Christ's injunction to love one another if it permitted the charges of interest on death. Okay, next we come to John Calvin. The funny thing about trying to blame Calvin for the rise of usury in predatory capitalism is that the Catholic nominalist philosophers, usury bankers, and usury popes all were doing their dirty work for the bankers before Calvin was born, or while he was still a little Catholic boy in France. Calvin was six years old when Leo X got the banker's ball rolling by granting limiting permission for usury in 1515. So how is he, how is he the initiator of it? That's what the history books say. That's what Catholics believe. By the way, Calvin was not of Judaic descent. His name is not Cohen. <laughs> He's from Picardy in France. They were middle class people. His name was Jean Calvin. And um, I refute that in an issue of our newsletter dedicated to the proposition of exposing the myth that Cromwell brought the Judaics to England. And he did not. And that's another myth that right wingers peddle. We all know about the left wing myths. We don't know about the right wing myths that the cryptocracy seeds in our ranks so we can dismiss the Puritans as <coughs> Judaizers and then never look at what the original early Puritans stand on the love of money and interest on loans is. And so they can continue to divide us and conquer us. Calvin did institute changes that were against the law of God, but he did so influenced by Catholic nominalist philosophers and theologians who pioneered this iniquity. This is in my book, Usury and Christendom, on pages 186 and 187. Calvin had started out as what? As a lawyer. And lawyers don't deal in God's law, usually. They traffic in man-made equity law. So Calvin has this inflated reputation as the su supposed supreme Bible scholar. But using situation ethics, Calvin declared that Old Testament laws were not binding on Christians in terms of an absolute prohibition on interest on loans of money to Christians. Calvin seized on the nominalist distinction between very low interest rates and excessive, or what Calvin called, biting interest rates. But this is a spurious distinction, which is still with us today. An Anglican bishop, Lancelot Andrews, answered Calvin eloquently when he observed that all usury is biting. There is no form of usury that is toothless, for it is an evil rule that declares, let it be done, provided it does not bite. Evil I say and Pharisaic, this is what is Christian, let it be done, provided it benefits. For whether it bites or not does not matter if we are looking for true justice. What matters is whether it benefits or not. End quote from Anglican Bishop Andrews. Here's an excerpt from a letter that Calvin wrote in 1545 to a Christian who had inquired about usury. Quote, it would be desirable if usurers were chased from every country. Passages in both the prophets and Psalms display the Holy Spirit's anger against usurers. Usury almost always travels with two inseparable companions, tyrannical cruelty and the art of deception. This is why the Holy Spirit advises all holy men who praise and fear God to abstain from usury. This is why no one should take interest from the poor and no one destitute by virtue of indigence or calamity or affliction should be forced into usury. Calvin goes on to assert the situation in which God brought the Jews together combined with other circumstances, made commerce without usury apt among them. Our situation is different. For that reason, I am unwilling to condemn it, so long it is practiced with equity and charity. We ought not to judge usury according to a few passages of scripture, but in accordance with the principle of equity. So here in this one section 
of Calvinism, and I'm not passing judgment on Calvinism as a whole. We see this double mind which continues to defeat us, which is at the heart of the schizophrenia. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and we are an unstable people. We look on Obama <coughs> as the uh, paradigm of evil, and yet at the same time, the people that the cryptocracy has us turning to are warmongers. If Romney had been elected president instead of Obama, most likely we'd be fighting a land war with Iran right now. So there are some extraordinary ways that God is even using Obama to try and make peace with Iran. At the same time, of course, the Republicans claim to be opposed to abortion and sodomy and alien immigration of our United States. I'm not sure that that's an authentic conviction. But so they have, they're pushing us two ways because what most of us truly want is someone who seeks peace in the world unless someone who invades our nation and then will fight. Instead of antagonizing these people who've been involved in Muslim civil wars for a thousand years and then they change their focus and they, they turn from each other and they look to Great Britain, France, or the United States. This is all deliberate. So the right wing is an unstable man. It's a schizophrenic man. Here's Calvin with his schizophrenia. On the one hand, and he never ever abandoned this, he despised users. But on the other hand, he felt, and I know some of you in this room probably feel the same way, that it was absolutely necessary to institute usury in order to create more wealth in society, that the situation demanded it. But just remember that if you don't want to be a double-minded person, when your daughter wants to come to you and tell you that she has to violate laws of sexual morality because the times they are changing, you can't tell her no. Because you too, in advocating usury because the times they are changing, are a situation ethicist. Calvin was trained as a lawyer, and his preference in this case is for equity over scripture. And he derives it from the Greek principle represented by the word epiki, denoting reasonableness as opposed to rigid law. That's what the Talmud says in many cases. Many times we think that the Talmud is very uh, rigid. Actually, it can be very relaxed. God has been rigid on this issue of no interest on loans. Let's relax it. That's equity. And this, to me, looks suspiciously like a Talmudic loophole, a prose book. Now, this is the Judaic magazine published by Rabbi Michael Lerner. I don't know if you should subscribe to it, but every once in a while you might <coughs> pick it up and see what counterintelligence you should gain from it. <laughs> <laughs> and this issue is right up my alley and Daniel's alley, Jubilee and Debt Abolition. They're not talking so much.